After 53 years of marriage, it's impossible to imagine life without your spouse. We can quarrel. And one of the rules after the transplant, the rule, is if we're arguing or have a disagreement about anything, the kidney is off the table. That's kidney recipient Carol McCabe. Carol and her husband, living kidney donor John, are our guests today. I'm Sarah Jen Castro, Senior Director of Marketing and Communications for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois, and your host for this edition of The Journey Continues. John and Carol, thank you so much for doing this with us. Can you tell us how you two first met? We met in Boston in college. I was a freshman. John was a sophomore. That was 1968. And surfing off the coast of Maine in a nor'easter in a snowstorm, came back to Boston. My roommate actually ended up opening the largest uh, sporting goods store in Cape Cod, so it's a natural progression. But I came back to Boston, and uh, there was a party going on on the block next door, and there was a fire and a brownstone, and through the smoke and haze, I saw this incredible woman, and then she disappeared only to reappear at the party that I was going to. Uh, I broke the man code and cut in on my roommate who was dancing with her and was determined that uh, she was going to be mine, and I just knew that uh, that moment. So the line I like to use is, uh, the first time I saw her, she started a fire in my heart that burns to this day. Oh, wow. I'm a quarty guy. <laughs> oh, that's very romantic. So it sounds like it was definitely love at first sight, at least for you. For me, it was. <laughs> yeah, it's only 50%. Well, we were actually both in relationships with other people at the time. So we started off as friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe John had some ulterior motives there. <laughs> Back in those days, you got pinned, you know, with your oh, college. Yeah. He was pinned to another girl when we met. So I don't know how you can say not so much. I, I was, but you know, she was in Detroit and you were there. And, and uh, once I saw you, all bets were off. Yeah, okay. So... Bit by bit by bit, he won my heart. Oh, yeah, that's very romantic. How have you maintained that over 53 years of marriage? How have you prioritized your relationship and kept that fire burning in your heart? I still bring her flowers for no reason. We try to do nice things for each other and surprise each other in a good way because there are always enough surprises in the wrong way. But, um, you know, Carol's good about uh, picking a place and making a date. We went to see Tommy up at uh, Northwestern, and uh, she arranged, uh, you know, for us to get the tickets and then stop by our favorite deli. And we did a picnic outside, and you know, went to the show. And you know, we do simple things like that, and we do, you know, more extravagant. Just taking time to think about each other. And we still have fun, and we still make each other laugh. That's so important. We can quarrel it, our arguments too, and one of the rules after the transplant. Um, the rule. The rule is if we're arguing or have a disagreement about anything, the kidney is off the table. That's a good rule. Yeah. She can never say, oh, I wish I hadn't taken that. I can never say, oh, I should never have given that. That is it's a one and done, and you know that's a firm rule. And we kept it for two years, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So, Carol, tell us a little bit how you learned you had issues with your kidneys to begin with. Well, it started with kidney stones. Back in 2001, I guess I had my first stone. And by 2014, was that when I had I had a major, major episode. And un, under surgery, I had 35 stones removed from one kidney. And it turned out it wasn't diet. It wasn't anything I was doing. It was my parathyroid. And I had three parathyroid glands removed, and after that, no more kidney stones. But the damage had already been done to my kidneys, the scar tissue, and what happened. They get 25 out of the other. Out of the other one. So, I mean, massive, massive kidney stones. And We were going to do our driveway with our stones. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I promised to a walkway. I didn't think I could do a driveway. <laughs> but um, the kidney function was slowly deteriorating, but at a very slow pace until 2021. In July, my function was at 20%, which is still pretty low, 
I was very fatigued, had no energy. It was, I was very tired. Let me it, jump in. What we did not know at the time is that at, at a GFR of 20, you're eligible to go on the national transplant list. Our terrible nephrologists did not give us that information. But we, we, we had changed nephrologists twice. And, and the, one of the messages to your listeners is you have to do your own work. You can't trust just what the doctors say. And unfortunately, we learned that the hard way. And uh, we had trusted him, and that was a mistake. So we did not even know Carol would have been eligible to be on the, on the national transplant list probably two years earlier, and she never actually went on the list. But had we known uh, that 20 was a magic number, we would have done things differently. But then... From July, her GFR was 20, and in November it was 14. And that was a precipitous drop in a very short period of time. And we had asked our urologist and our nephrologist multiple times, will Carol ever have to go on dialysis? Will she ever need a kidney transplant? And we had always been told, oh, oh we're going to know she's no, full. It'll be okay. None Everything's no. great. You don't have to worry about that. And then it's like, oh, wow. Oh. We aren't worrying about it. You know, so we had, we, Again, we believe what we were told rather than doing our own research, so shame on us. I think kidney information has come a long way since then. I think the doctors are more up on what's happening with the kidney. So anyway, her GFR dropped to 14. The doctor said, here is a list of the six transplant centers in the local areas, as well as Wisconsin and Iowa. Reach out to them and... Here's a referral. Literally handed us a piece of paper and said, start calling. And so we did start calling, and uh, our son in law is in the medical device business, and he was able to secure us uh, an interview at Northwestern, where we had our follow up, uh, basically a second opinion. The nephrologist there was really wonderful to us. He took an hour, looked at all of Carol's things, and then said, "Yeah, you're you're in trouble. You do need a kidney transplant." and as we were pulling out of the garage, they hit the wall with the car. I mean, it was, post to post. Was, we're pretty upset. I mean, it's, it's you know, you, the reality is set in. Well, the reality was also that um, at my age, I was not really el- eligible to go on the cadaver. Well, you were eligible, but you would never, I would never make it because it's five to seven years. And I was told if I started dialysis at my age, which at that time was well, 72. 72, that my life expectancy was three and a half years. So most likely I would not have made it to a cadaver donor. And she would have been one of the 18 people who die every day waiting for, for a kidney transplant. We did a parallel path that Loyola, as well as one other institution, Both were willing to talk to us at our age, which was unusual because several other institutions, we had two that never even called us back, Uh, local, and in well-known, good programs, you know, well-respected programs. And we called several times and gave our age and, I mean, didn't even call back to say, go away. Northwestern was willing to talk to us, but we had our meeting in December and the first interview they could give us for intake was uh, May 9th? May 8th. May 8th. And we actually did the transplant at Loyola on May 5th. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So it's a good thing you didn't wait for that, exactly. that consultation. Well, I think you bring up a really good point about advocating for yourself and also doing some some research and finding out some information on your own. Because I wish it was uncommon to hear that from people that, you know, I went to the doctor, I did all that I was supposed to do, and they said, oh, it's no big deal. Don't worry about it. And then they find themselves in kidney failure all of a sudden. I do think you're right, Carol, that kidney care has come a long way and that now some general practitioners are a little more aware of those things and are referring people to nephrologists sooner. Nephrologists are a little more proactive and have new programs in their practices where they're referring people to transplant centers sooner. So there have been developments, but unfortunately, we do hear that sometimes that people don't have the information. They don't know quite what to ask. And so they just say, well, you know, if there was a problem, the doctor would let me know. And then it ends up, you know, you're in a, a much different set of circumstances than if it had been brought to your attention years before. 
Exactly. But Sarah Jane, we did ask the question. Mm. We did ask the questions. We did say, do we have to think about dialysis? What do we have to plan on? We had two different nephrologists and, and a urologist that we really like, trust, and respect who has been very good to us, who all said, you're fine. And they were wrong. It's not malicious. Nobody has a crystal ball. And somebody should have said to us, not likely, but why don't you start thinking about how you want to approach this? I mean, I didn't even realize there were two different types of dialysis. Mm-hmm much less, you know, what all was involved. I had no idea where the ports went. You know, I, it was a foreign language to to us. Yeah, it's a whole other vocabulary. It's a whole other world that you, you probably wouldn't ever have encountered otherwise. I'm sorry that that was the case, that you asked the questions and it still found yourself in this situation where now you're having to sort of make decisions very quickly versus... We've got a plan in place. We're thinking about ahead for the, the years to come. Right. Exactly. The, the other thing I want to really emphasize for your listeners is how important it is to be your own advocate. At Loyola, we had two very fierce advocates, um, Megan Parker, who was my uh, transplant coordinator. Your general audience will know that Carol had her own coordinator. I have mine, and the two never meet, and you know we keep a very solid wall between us and all that stuff. But, you know, she was a, a very strong advocate for us. And the nephrologist who has gone doing Carol's ongoing care, uh, Dr. Sodi, without those two people advocating for us, it would have been difficult. We ran into roadblocks at every turn. And you can't let the roadblocks stop you. We At the other facility that we tested, Carol had cysts in her kidneys. Dear God, if you've had, you know, that many stones, of course you have cysts. But they had been monitored by the urologist over a five-year period. And we had multiple MRIs, CTs, and that with both with contrast and without, showing that there'd been no change in the cysts. What they're concerned with in a transplant is, are those cysts cancerous? Just the fact that you have benign cysts is no problem if you have cysts that are cancerous. As you understand, once you take immunosuppressants, the cancer explodes. We understand at the other facility, they were rightly concerned about it. So we met with the nephrologist, and he said, you're, Carol, you're going to have to take this test, and it has dye in it, and the dye is radioactive, and because your kidney function is so low, it has some really nasty side effects, or potentially. It was a 10 to 20%. It wasn't like it's like one half of 1%. Well, now I had to sign a waiver to saying that I was aware of the risk. And the risks were that her joints would turn to leather and stop functioning, and that her skin would, would become like an orange peel. And I said to the family, if you were doing the transplant for quality of life, if she has this reaction, it destroys her quality of life. Well, I don't care if she has to take the test. I said, have you looked at the other five tests that are in her file? And he said, no. I said, well, I sent them over a month ago. And he said, well, my partner looked at him and said, oh, great. What did your partner say? Well, I don't know. I didn't talk to him. I said, well, could she? No, she has to take the test. I mean, it was a stupid conversation. So we get home that afternoon, and I call my coordinator, and I say, this did not go well. What can we do? And she called back literally five minutes later and said, you either take the test or you're out of the program for six months. Now, we've already established we didn't have six months. And... Because we're used to advocating for ourselves, I said, I want to speak to the head of the program. So we recount the story to the chief, and he's looking at Carol's file, and he said, can I see the MRI with contrast from 2019? Boom, right on top, handed it to him. He looked at it for 45 seconds. I mean, not even a full minute. And what? We're cool. Everything's good. We don't we don't need to do anything. We're good to go. And if we hadn't questioned, we I either took the test or I was out of the program. But we advocated for ourselves, took it a step further, and got the green light. And I've got to tell you, that four days was absolute hell. Because at our age, there are a lot of things that can go wrong in this process. It's not guaranteed that we're going to be able to do the transfer. And if this other facility said no, that eliminated 50% of our alternatives and all of our aches were in one basket. When you don't know, it's pretty scary stuff. 
you're definitely to be commended for having that conversation, bringing that up and continuing to say like, look, the this doesn't make any sense. We've already done all these tests. Surely putting Carol's health further at risk isn't the answer here. So as you're entering this process of Carol getting worked up for transplant, John, had you already decided at that point you were going to be her donor? How did you come to that conclusion? There was never any question. I mean, the, the one Carol would not accept a kidney from her children. The reason is, is, you know, if she's got kidney disease, they may have kidney disease later in life. And, you know, she didn't want to limit their options. As soon as dialysis or transplant came on the table, instantly, you know, I was the, the person who wanted to donate. I mean, she is the love of my life. She is the mother of my children. We have spent 57 years together. 56, yeah. oh, a long time. <laughs> and, and I wasn't ready to uh, cash in our chips just yet. During his workup, because you have so many tests and things and you have a psychological evaluation, and they asked John what his greatest fear was about the transplant, and his answer was? That I wouldn't be a match. I think that speaks really highly of your level of dedication and also your love for Carol that your concern was not for yourself. It was that you wouldn't be a match and then she wouldn't have this life-saving treatment. Right. The, the surgery, while not insignificant, is relatively routine. It's done all the time. The recovery for the donor is really pretty easy. I mean, I did it at 73. I was walking two miles five days after surgery. Wow. And I'm not Superman. I mean, I, I walk two miles now. I don't. It's, it's not like I walk five miles or ten miles or do marathons or anything like that. Did you run into any difficulties getting cleared to donate, or was it a fairly smooth process once you found the the center that you were going to be listed with and found your coordinators? For me, it was pretty linear because I am like I would. I'm very blessed. I'm in, I'm in really. Good health. Carol, what was the workup like for you? It sounds like you hit some roadblocks pretty early on, but once you got past that, were things fairly smooth? It was the the regular testing, you know, stress test, heart. So the facility that she did her testing was not Loyola. No. She tested at the other hospital. I tested at Loyola. I was interviewing my facility as much as they were interviewing me and the same with John, and we were comparing notes as to and, and Loyola wanted to test me as a living donor because if I couldn't donate, it's going to be hard to get a kidney for Carol. And the other facility wanted to test Carol to make sure she was healthy enough to receive a kidney. So each had its own way of looking at the world. And they both knew that we were... We, they were in constant communication. It was communication with each other, and it was just a question of which facility we were more comfortable with. Loyola cared much more about us than the statistics. Loyola cared much more about us as people rather than as following the processes. And then the other hospital was very process-driven. Mm-hmm. It's a wonderful facility. I mean, uh, it, it's a great hospital. I'm not knocking the hospital in any way, just there. One was process-driven and one were people-driven. And, and I got to tell you, being a patient, being in a people-driven place beats the hell out of being in a process tree. I've been in that position myself. You feel so much more at ease trusting someone with your life when you know they care about me as a person and they, they've they looked at the two of you as people and that's got to be worth its weight in gold. Carol, how did you feel about John donating his kidney? Did you have any hesitations about him undergoing surgery or were you like, great? I didn't have any hesitation. Hmm. I really appreciated it. <laughs> oh. And it was really funny. I never I never even doubted that we, we would be a match. I, I don't know why. I just I, I just thought everything was going to turn out all right. And when they came and said he was a match, I was like, hey, praise be, hallelujah. And I was like, yeah, I know it. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. So the other silly line that I use being a cornball, is that um, I knew we were a perfect match when I first met her, and now I've got medical science back in the air. <laughs> I like that. That's cute. What was surgery day like? Were you under at the same time? Did you get to spend time with each other that day? 
Her daughter Surgery drove us in. in together. Her daughter drove us to the surgery to the hospital. Yeah, I think at five thirty. Yeah, five thirty in the morning, and then uh, we, you know, got prepped kind of together, and then uh, they shipped me off. I, I waited in the waiting room. Yeah, I woke up about I guess nine thirty ten, and Carol was still in surgery, and she got out around eleven thirty twelve, I think, and then I asked to be with her, so they wheeled me in and let me sit with her for the next you know, period of time until I had to go up to my room. I would have really liked it if we had been in a room together. Then they said that wasn't possible because the level of care that she needed was different than what I needed. And, I mean, the surgery was Thursday morning, and I, my son brought me home Friday afternoon. How are you both feeling now? It's fine. I have sought some effects from the immunosuppressants. Some days are good, some days aren't so great. But overall... I feel so much better than I did prior to the surgery. And I would never know that I'm, I'm down a beat. That's wonderful to hear. I'm glad for for the both of you that it was a smooth recovery for the most part. I had a hiccup. Accidents happened. Something happened in the recovery of the transplant or, or the implantation of it. But I guess it got nicked. It was leaking. Oh, my goodness. That's a 72-year-old kidney. Yeah. They, <laughs> they, they discovered it. I was supposed to have been released on Sunday, and um, my numbers weren't doing what they expected that they would be doing. So they knew something was wrong, and then they discovered that my body cavity was filling with fluid, basically Your- urine. So Tuesday, I went back in and had a secondary surgery. They reopened me. Yes, fairly common where they connect the ureters. His ureter coming out of the kidney to my ureter with the different connections. Usually that's where the leak is, but those were all fine. So it was the kidney itself. Maybe got a punctured or air or something, but the kidney was leaking. So I had to have a drain come out my side, the tube, and a catheter, which was both were in place for three weeks, which was not pleasant. But once they were removed, the recovery was so rapid. I mean, it was like night and day. And I, I see how, had that not happened, I think the surgery would have been a piece of cake. It would have been so easy. It really would have been. And so you're coming up on your second anniversary yes. this year. Wow, that's exciting. Congratulations. Do you have advice for other couples on both how to stay in love for so many years and how to navigate a difficult medical situation where you do have to step up and advocate so much. That's mostly it. The, with the medical condition, advocating for yourself and for the love, just kindness. Keep it new. Keep it fun. Yeah. Try not to go to bed angry. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard work. Don't give up the ship because it's a great reward at the end. Yeah, so far so good, you know. Yeah. The medical side is easier, actually. You have to be your own advocate. You have to advocate for yourself. Yeah. The other thing I would add is to always take, take notes. notes. Mm. Uh, bring a piece of paper with you because you're going to hear words you've never heard before. You're not going to remember them. I had a, a friend of mine whose wife needed a kidney transplant, and I went with him on several appointments. She, hers was much more complicated. She had lupus, and I mean, it was got pretty crazy. But he was a very calm person and took very copious notes, and he'd stop the doctor and say, now, how do you spell that? What does that mean? What are the alternatives? And that sort of detail becomes really critically important. And, and it's still important, especially now that Carol's on the immunosuppressants, because each drug has its own set of, of side effects. You know, she had one that was making her lose her hair, and she decided you know, they, they had switched her to that one because the other one gave her an upset stomach. And she said, I'll live with the upset stomach rather than losing my hair. It's pretty <laughs> yeah. it's- you know, they do monitor you all the way very closely that first year, trying to adjust the meds to the right dosage. So I was on, on the tacromilius, I was on 13 milligrams a day. And that, some of the side effects of that are tremors. Well, trying to eat a bowl of soup or something, you get it up to your mouth and there's no soup with a spoon. <laughs> but so I started at 13, I'm down to two milligrams. Oh, great. And I no longer have the tremors. So that's how, you know, they work through. That's why all the blood tests that you go through is adjusting your meds and getting the right amount for you. I'm very lucky uh, the Loyola protocol does not, well, for me, did not include prednisone. Yeah, I think a lot of, of centers have moved away from that in recent years. Yeah, 
And I'm so glad that I'm not on a daily dose of prednisone because that's a very... Why do you think other couples or people in their 70s don't pursue transplant? Mostly because I don't think they think it's available to them because, you know, most of the data out there says at 65, you're, you know, you're, you're one and done. If you're over 65, you're not going to get a transplant. And that's why we why we feel so strongly about standing up and speaking out for Loyola because they're doing that. The other thing is Loyola is connected with the Heinz Veteran Associ- uh, Veterans Hospital. I'm a veteran. My father served 28 years in the Army. Carol's dad was a Marine and lost a leg in Bougainville in the South Pacific in World War II. So, you know, we, we pretty much bleed red, white, and blue. And what's going on at Heinz is nothing short of a miracle. He's done almost 100 transplants on 70-year-old Vietnam-era veterans, mostly African-American, at other facilities wouldn't even been considered. Now, they're using kidneys that other people may, may have rejected. You know, and maybe it's an HIV, maybe it's a hepatitis, maybe it's an older kidney. But for someone 73, 74, 75 years old, my age, Vietnam era, getting a kidney is life-altering. I can't say enough about the, the, the amazing people at Loyola and what they do. And so for us to be able to be poster children or poster old people, which I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's really, really important that people know that there really is, there's a lot of, a lot of good stuff going on. And there's our quality of life is, is what it was pre trans Anything else you'd like to share with us before we wrap up? We can't say enough about, how important it is if, if you're having kidney issues to get tested, to find out where you are, to understand what it means early on, and to get started on a program as soon as you find out what your needs are. Mm-hmm. And being able to do this preemptively without Carol having to go on dialysis is just a wonderful gift from the gods. Thank you so much to Carol and John for sharing their inspiring and beautiful story of self-advocacy with us. There is no age cap on kidney transplants. Each patient is assessed on a case-by-case basis, and each transplant center has different criteria. To find the transplant center and team that's the best fit for you, visit our website at nkfi.org. I'm Sarah Jane Castro, and this is The Journey Continues. Prevention is a key part of our mission at NKFI. That's why at the end of each episode, we offer a health or nutrition tip. Here's today's nutrition tip about calcium. Calcium is a mineral that is essential to bones and teeth with 99% of the calcium in our body stored in them. Our bones are constantly being broken down and rebuilt and we use the stored calcium in our body to do this process. Our nerves, heart, and the ability to clot blood all use calcium to do their work as well. As we age, we start to lose the amount of calcium stored in our body. In women, as estrogen levels decline with age, calcium absorption can also decline. Calcium is rich in yogurt, milk, fortified dairy alternatives like soy milk and almond milk, sardines and salmon with bones, cheese, tofu, green leafy vegetables like broccoli, turnip leaves, kale, fortified breakfast cereals, fortified juices, nuts and seeds, legumes and grains, cornmeal and corn tortillas. Calcium is better absorbed by your body if you eat a food with vitamin D in it as well. So milk fortified with vitamin D allows you to better absorb the calcium in milk. Adults aged 19 years or older need 1,000 milligrams a day of calcium, and women over the age of 51 need 1,200 milligrams per day. Eating three servings of dairy foods a day can help you meet that goal. If you have chronic kidney disease, you may have to limit the amount of dairy-rich foods per day. Talk with your kidney doctor to know how much calcium a day is right for you. With today's nutrition tip, I'm Melissa Press, a registered dietitian nutritionist, 